All right, well, the first thing I want to do today is take a kind of a poll to figure out how you're doing. And I can't get this poll from those of you at home, so you'll have to just let us know in the Facebook feed or the YouTube feed or even email us if you're where you stand on this. But we've been talking now about the Gospel of Thomas for quite some time. And so by now you should have this sense of a, of a different way of thinking about who Jesus was in his context. And for the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus was not this kind of um, savior who is crucified on a cross to redeem you from your sins, but rather he's more of a wisdom guide, someone who's trying to remind you that the divine that you're seeking is actually within, and that your work is to do the seeking that might allow you to find that divine spark, that sort of spirit of the living God within, and to give expression to it. And that the whole religious experience is not necessarily about uh, following a set of dogmas, but taking that journey. And that's the Jesus we meet in the Gospel of Thomas. Elaine Pagels, in her book, kind of puts it this way. Her book is called Beyond Belief, The Secret Gospel of Thomas. And she writes this. Jesus encourages those who seek by telling them that they already have the internal resources they need to find what they're looking for. One of the sayings is this, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. And if you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Some of the disciples still would question him saying, but do you want us to fast, or how should we pray? Should we give alms? What diet should we observe? And in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, Jesus responds to such questions with these practical and straightforward answers. But in Thomas, Jesus gives no such instruction. Instead, when his disciples ask him, what are we supposed to do, or how are we supposed to pray, how are we supposed to eat, should we fast, should we give money, Jesus answers with this koan. Do not tell lies and do not do what you hate, for all things are plain in the sight of heaven. The capacity to discover truth is within you. So I don't know about you, but for me, that's a different way of thinking about how Jesus functions in my religious life. Right? Jesus doesn't function as someone that I give thanks to for redeeming me from my sins. Rather, Jesus functions as a partner for me to go on my own spiritual journey. It's a completely different kind of way of imagining how God moves in the world and the way in which Jesus sort of articulates that. So my question for you, and you don't have to answer this publicly, but given we've sort of learned that this um, voice of Jesus, which potentially predates some of the gospel voices that we're so used to hearing, has it given you a, um, a different way of thinking about who Jesus might be for you? And not that you have to completely give up on the way in which the gospels tell the story, obviously, because they are an ongoing articulation of this story of faith. But now to know that possibly the role of Jesus in your life is someone to energize or invite you into your own spirit journey, your own soul's journey, does that resonate for you? Does that open up some new possibilities for you? Do you think that's helpful? Do you think that's hurtful? Do you think that's exciting? Do you think that's scary? Where do you fall as you kind of meet this new Jesus is something I want you to think about today. And maybe when we do Q&A, if you have some reflections on that, you could share some of your perspectives. But that's really the question about um, whether we begin to integrate the Jesus we meet in the Gospel of Thomas into our understanding of Jesus and the way in which that character plays a role in our spiritual journey. So that's, that's one of the things I want you to think about today. So I want to do a couple things with that. One is to kind of talk about how did we get so hung up on a Jesus that is, um, well, I don't know if you remember, but sort of the code language was Jesus died for my sins, right? It's all about Jesus dying and resurrecting from the dead. That's what our religion is centered on. 
In fact, I brought the cross out today as a reminder that that is one strong option in the way of thinking about Jesus if you read the Gospels. It's all about this brutal death and this capacity to overcome that death. But why did that become the dominant story? If you open up your hymn book, do you still have your hymn books around? Where did I put mine? Here's mine. Grab, grab your red hymn book and I'll show you what I mean. If you go to page 127 in your, in your red hymn book, it's in the front part. So not, don't go into the liturgy, don't go into the hymns, just page 127. Let's get on board with that one first. And just give me a nod if you're there. Yeah, good, good. This is the Apostles' Creed. So as you recall, we would read this creed, and we still read it from time to time, but this is one of the creeds that we use to orient our understanding of who Jesus is and how we function as a church. What I want you to pay attention to now that we've talked about this new way of thinking about Jesus, that his words, his life, his teachings, his wisdom can serve as a guide for us to go on our own journey. Hear how this creed, what does this creed focus on? So let's, let's read it together. And as we read it together, I want you to just kind of listen to where is the focus in this creed. So let's do it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right. You get the vibe of this particular creed that you've grown up with? Where, <laughs> what's missing in this creed from your perspective, given what we just read and what we're talking about with the Gospel of Thomas? Anybody get the obvious answer? Huh? Yeah, his life and teaching. Jesus' life takes place between uh, like line three of the second paragraph and line four. He's born of the Virgin Mary. So you have, he's got a divine birth. And what's the next line? Suffered. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. They skip his entire, <laughs> the entire life is gone. The teachings are gone. The wisdom's gone. The healing is gone. The narrative's gone. It's, he was born and then he died. Well, you know, if we did a eulogy for your life, I would hope we would do a little better than this, right? There, you, you probably had a lot going on between those two events. But you can see the focus of the creeds. Why are we so obsessed with the death and the resurrection? Why does that become the central theme of Christianity? And I, I'll give you a couple of what I think are hints. And just to invite you to think, I think it would be fine to get a wedge in between those two lines and place the parables, place the teachings, place the way in which Jesus journeyed in world, and let that be the dominant narrative that we use to guide our spiritual lives. Why this focus on death and resurrection? Well, first, um, just the, the kind of the raw information. Probably when Jesus was... Um, functioning as what they called an itinerant sage. And itinerant means he just moves from place to place. So he's a sage that moves through communities trying to bring this um, insight that you hear reflected in the Gospel of Thomas and some of the phrases that we think he spoke, trying to bring that to light. That's what he's doing, right? He's not causing a whole lot of trouble, but his teachings are seen as a sort of a threat to the Roman cultural norms of the day. So like the way in which you heard the stories today, right? The wealthy who feel like they're the ones who've been blessed in this time and place. They're the ones who literally are blessed by God. They're the ones who go to temple and buy the most expensive sacrificial meats to be sacrificed on the altar to atone for their sins. The wealthy are seen as being the most righteous. Jesus' teachings turns that on its head and says, no, 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 no. Spirituality has nothing to do with your wealth. 
In fact, he says, congratulations to the poor, for they're the ones who inherit this great kingdom. I mean, he completely shakes at the very foundations of Roman civilization. So it is that the Romans had one good way of getting rid of people who shook at the foundations of Roman civilization, and it was the brutality of crucifixion. And it was a horrible way to uh, clean sweep dissent. But that's how Jesus lost his life. So you can imagine the terror in the fabric of the community who listened to Jesus' wisdom and saw him crucified on this cross. And the, and the challenge of overcoming that shock to the system. I can totally understand why they would focus in on that. You know, that's not the way his life should have ended. He should not have died on a Roman cross for the kind of nonviolent teaching he was doing that lifted up so many lives. That's not the way his life should have ended. And so the focus in on why that happened makes perfect sense. And yet over time, right, we built up a whole theology around Roman crucifixion and integrated it into Christianity. I'm not sure that was a good idea, but that's where we took it. The other parallel kind of, what would you call it, like, dominant religious energy of the day in Jesus' time was temple worship in Jerusalem. And the temple centered around these ideas of sacrifice, where to atone for your um, sins, so to speak, or what you were doing wrong, you would, you would sacrifice something on the altar. And I don't think it took too much brain power to put those two things together. And so the early church began to try to make sense of this by saying maybe Jesus sacrificed his own life like we've been doing it on the temple to atone for the sins of the world. And that energy of making sense of what happened in the end connected with the whole atonement experience in temple and the Jewish tradition behind that because this was a Jewish movement created this theology that we've expanded ever since. And because this was so shocking, it just sort of took over, I think, for all of this kind of wisdom teaching that we should be paying attention to. So in my mind, the, the question is, we can still use this language, I think, to understand Jesus, but we should, we should open it up wider than that. We should include all of this kind of wisdom teaching and see like the Gospel of Thomas is calling us, that the spiritual journey isn't to be dependent on that theological framing, but to take the journey ourselves, to also seek that spirit that is within. So what might that look like? Clearly, it changes maybe the way we think about Jesus, but what could it mean as far as the institution goes? You know, what, what does church look like if everybody who walks through the door, including all of you and me, are nurturing some sort of inner divine energy or vibration or spirit or something that they're trying to get in touch with in their own way and manifest or give expression to, that every soul's journey actually matters and that church is an accumulation of so many interesting and vibrant journeys how does church work in that environment? The Westar Institute that I follow a lot gave some examples of, of why, uh, how churches might um, think about moving forward given, given that reality, right? And as they do that work, they come up with a couple of things. One is the list that I'm gonna review with you in a minute. But before they get to that list, they say humankind has always has this need to be kind of religious or spiritual. It's just been part of our evolution. And partly it's because we seek the language of symbols to make meaning of our lives. So we don't just look at something and just try to, you know, describe it like the scientific method. We like to add symbolic language to it, metaphorical language. We love that layer that helps us construct meaning so we feel connected to it, not only at a brain level, but at some sort of deep emotional level. And, and that's what religion does, right? It, it says, um, 
Jesus would talk like that all the time. He'd say, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, right? He'd start to speak in flowery language so that you might enter into this kind of understanding in a way that hits you in a different place than it would if it was just a morality tale or information. So humankind is like that. You're like that. You need symbolic, metaphorical language, poetic language, hymnody, you know, to guide you into meaning. So we all need that in our lives. Everybody does, not just religious people. That's the way it is for everybody. So that's number one. Number two is the religious sensitivity of humankind is that we know we are finite. So there's something about the human spirit that likes to layer our finite experience onto a more expansive backdrop, a more infinite backdrop. Like we're a part of something bigger than just our little lifespan. And maybe we think about our lives as a perpetuation of a lineal, you know, a family line and that it'll extend in the future. Or maybe we're part of a larger life story, right? We want to fit into something bigger than just our little slice of time and space and location, right? So that's a part of being human. And everybody's like that. You're like that. So you don't just live your life for your little slice. You live your life inside of this larger context. And then the last one is that we all have this kind of need or longing to sort of connect to that sense of more or that, that broader sense that holds us all. And I was reminded of this a couple of weeks ago. We had an experience, um, a sound experience down in the main hall that we invited a bunch of people to. And out from that was a reminder of the, there's a, a mantra in Hinduism that's very old. You, you know this term, it's called Om. Om. You've heard that term, Om, as a kind of, a kind of reflective mantra. And the woman who was describing this to us said, one of the reasons why that mantra is so powerful and so um, moving is because the way the mouth works and the way the sound works, it also kind of reminds you of home, right? You think about home, where do I belong? <laughs> well, we all want that kind of belonging, right? And, I, and when she first said it, I was a little bit pessimistic. I was, yeah, right, right, right. But then when I heard people starting to chant it together, there's something very uh, visceral about that chant, right? That makes you feel like you belong again inside the big home, the big home. And even the word itself functions as a symbolic connection to that. It, it hits all the cylinders on the religious experience for that reason. That's why religion matters. That's why hopefully you come here each week. So if we open up this idea of why we do what we do and think more creatively about how spirit's moving in our time, what could church do? And one of the things that the West Art Institute reminds us of, and I think this is true, I've seen it again and again, is that many people in our day are not using the kind of the code language that we've grown comfortable with to articulate their spiritual journey. And so I think one of the challenges moving forward is how do congregations create place for people with diverse language sets that are also seeking the same thing? So you're not inviting somebody to church to adapt to or adjust to your language set. You're inviting people to church to gather for this religious experience to say, tell me how your language set works. Tell me what you're discovering as you seek the spark within and find language to express it. And as Westar tried to figure out what, what is the language of the current cultural um, the culture that we find ourselves in, these are some examples of what they hear. Many people talk about it as being kind of a, a vibrant life energy. You know, I'm connected to this sort of energy that I feel bound to, that resonates in me and resonates in everything else. That's the language they're using that replaces the code language you and I use all the time, their idea of God. Right? It's not like they're wrong. That's just the symbolic language that you're using to describe that. That's a perfect example. The other one is sort of the interrelationship of everything. 
You can hear in that phrase, right, the connection to something more, that my life is interconnected with everything. I, I don't stand alone, I stand interconnected to all that is. That's religious language. And, and, and for people, church people like you and I, to be able to go, wow, that's powerful. I mean, in my tradition, I might say it this way, but to be able to acknowledge that in another's life, that's helping them seek that spirit within. Another one that comes up again and again is sort of the idea of wonder that sort of holds you in a moment of silence or awe. And we hear this over and over again. People who love spirituality and nature, who will go backpacking or to see a waterfall or to hear a bird song and it just makes them pause and invites them into this silent moment of awe. For them, that is their spiritual moment, right? That resonates with their you know, life story. That's, that's religion in our time. It's, it, for us to be able to say, yes, I understand where you're coming from. You can frame it differently because you have all this other language that you use, but that's what they're up to, and to celebrate that. And then the last two are sort of ones that we're familiar with. Solidarity, standing alongside of each other like we do with our mission outreach work, but that sense of how do I give expression to compassion and in compassionate moments. I meet my neighbor in a different way. I see them with new eyes. I see myself differently. People talk about that all the time. How is that an articulation of this stirring spirit within? And the last one is sort of a just being honest about who I am in the world. I right? say, you know, I don't always get it right. Uh, I need a place where I can make mistakes and say, yeah, I'm, I've got some broken parts of me and that's okay. You know, I've got trauma from my past experiences that I carry with me. That's okay. We need places to lay down those burdens so that we can continue to mature and grow. Those are religious moments, if you understand religion the way we're talking about it. And I think Jesus was onto that, particularly in these phrases of the Gospel of Thomas. How can we live more fully into that as a people? Lastly, I think that the final thing I want to leave you with today as you think about that and think about, are you open to expanding the way in which you see spirit moving in the world and what could that look like as this congregation chooses to move beyond my years of leadership into its future? It is a question to ask yourselves, right? How do we construct community that is a little bit like that restaurant in Berkeley? That's The name of that restaurant is just Gather. I don't know if you've been there, it's got pretty good food. Just that's the name of the restaurant, gather. Gather is, if the Greek word for gather is ekklesia, which is the word that means church. What does it mean just to gather together on a shared journey into meaning? Whew, that is a great question. Is church just the gathering place? where literally all are welcome to that journey. Would that change the creed that you speak every week? Would that change your perspective of the person who comes who doesn't share your nomenclature or your code words? I would hope so. It might even be reflected in the statement that we use in this church every week that we worked on for so long that I think is in your bulletin somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. Is it in this one? It is. If you turn to page six in your bulletin for today, think about this as a creed, right? That might reflect a little bit about what we're talking about here. And I'm kind of proud of this one because we worked hard on finding the language for this. It didn't achieve everything I had hoped it would achieve, but it did capture the essence of what we're talking about this morning. And in some ways it paints a beautiful picture of how church can function in the future. It says who we are, why we are a community, a gathering, right? We're a gathering, a church, an ecclesia. We are a community grounded in the life and teachings of Jesus. We opened up those two sentences in that creed and put in life and teachings, it's beautiful. We embrace an open approach to every spiritual journey. We ask questions together and value each voice. We strive for justice through service to the world, and we seek to be transformed 
by the path we walk together. If you ask me, that reflects a lot of what this little teaching series is trying to explore. How do we partner with someone who took these uh, steps into life 2,000 years ago and saw a divine spark in everyone? How do we travel in that way today, both individually and collectively as well? That feels like the question we need to ask ourselves going forward. All right, with that, let me just open it up for any of your insights. Uh, Bruce, you got the microphone? Uh, let's just do two or three kind of reflections on the content for today here, but you always come up with something interesting. And uh, today we want to welcome Tucker, who's our new sound guy, uh, who will replace uh, Bruce when he's on vacation, like next week. So welcome, Tucker. And uh, Tucker will come to you with a microphone. If you've got a question or thought, just raise your hand. It's always an awkward moment, this silence, but you always have something, something to say. No, not today. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that today. Um, I want you to think about that, though, because I, I next week I'm going to try to move us in a little bit different direction, but I wanted to pause for sure today to kind of open up what are the implications if we were to take the way in which the Gospel of Thomas gives us exposure to the words of Jesus in a different kind of way, what do we do with that, or, or not, right? Do we just keep perpetuating the standard uh, paradigm, or do we open up some sort of parallel conversation that could work alongside of that paradigm that would invite more people to be included? Uh, that really is a great question for us. All right, uh, with that, uh, we'll continue on with our service for today, and um, that will, I'm on the wrong page here. Oh, is it a song? Yep, 887. Uh, let's sing together hymn number 887. Let's sing. 